your big picture plan um, is uh, partially to make New Hampshire more business friendly, uh, draw in entrepreneurship, um, and it actually, in, in broad terms, it, it almost sounds a little bit like what Chris Sununu was pitching two years ago uh, in terms of uh, trying to, to make the tax structure more business friendly, regulatory hurdles lessened, uh, keep new graduates here by giving them some debt relief, uh, a bunch of that stuff. Um, so how does your idea of drawing young entrepreneurs to the state differ from what the governor is yeah. was pitching? Yeah, so I, I appreciate again the chance to be here today. Uh, almost anybody running for major office would probably tell you at least the headline would look very similar, right? I mean, right. often, uh, my one of my biggest problems with Governor Sununu, this gets right to your point, is that I think he lacks a specific mission. Uh, he, he is like the dog that chased a car, not thinking through what would happen once the teeth got in the bumper. Election night was sort of the point. And for me, this is, uh, you're trying, you're learning along the way, the way you run, about 265, 270 meet and greets over 18 months. So you teach a little. Who is this guy? What does he want to accomplish uh, for the state of New Hampshire? But you're learning a ton, uh, thousands of conversations. So a lot of this is to learn and to build po uh, political capital that you get to spend as governor. Uh, so specificity matters. That's one of the ways that you earn capital. So the mission statement, broadly speaking, is that uh, I want New Hampshire to be the best state in America to start and raise a family and to start and grow a business. And those two are, um, well, maybe not surprisingly related. Uh, the I focus more on the entrepreneurship end rather than more broadly the business end. And because I think that's where the uh, market inefficiency is. That's where the opportunity is. That's where the better match for New Hampshire's strengths uh, lies. Uh, that's where I think we get a better return on investment of uh, finite public dollars. I think uh, I, I've not taken the pledge. We need additional revenue. I, th I, am, I have a reputation for being pretty smart with a buck in uh, elected office. I audit city, county, and state governments professionally. I direct to corporate relations at UNH. I have a, my reputation is not one that um, reflexively spends money. But when you do the analysis of uh, trying to achieve that mission and the strategies and tactics that would get you there, you do the math of it. And, uh, and I've come to the conclusion that we need additional revenue in order to sustainably, effectively achieve the mission I'm laying out. And that's why I focus more on entrepreneurship, I think more than Chris does. States that try to focus on luring uh, established businesses into their state or region uh, will find that you often get stuck in a loop that's uh, very difficult to maintain and it is very expensive. You provide uh, tax incentives, credits, relief on local or state taxes, uh, usually for a finite period of time, 10, 15 years. And then what you find typically is at the end of that promised window, they seek a re-upping, often with additional sweeteners, or else they threaten to move to another location. And uh, there are states where this is the loop. Uh, we don't have, even with additional revenue that I'm talking about, you, that would not be a model that the state of New Hampshire could likely sustain. Uh, and it also is not healthy because it does not create a wide, stable, dynamic base from which to create jobs. That's, so number one is that. Number two, 80% uh, of net new jobs in the country get created by young businesses, new businesses. The majority of new businesses fail. That's the nature of entrepreneurship. But the ones that succeed are responsible for almost all net new job growth in your community, uh, region, or state. Uh, we have seen a relative collapse in entrepreneurship as a state and as a country over the last 40 years or so. It's one of the main reasons why the macro numbers economically often look really good. 3.9% national unemployment came out earlier today. That's an amazing number on the surface. But there are underlying challenges which um, uh, pose uh, problems for us as an economy in the long run. It is the collapse of entrepreneurship. So I want to reverse the business profits tax cut, for example. That's a big, I mean, that's an obvious and big difference. Chris Sununu uh, wants to keep pushing that gas pedal down. Uh, here's the reality. Most new businesses don't make a profit in the first five years. You could cut the business profits tax to nothing, 
But if you don't make a profit, a cut in the BPT will not uh, generate additional liquidity or incentive. I do support the cut in the business enterprise tax, which you can pay whether or not you make a profit. If you ask uh, new businesses, entrepreneurs, young businesses, the things that matter to them is often, uh, how can I reduce smart risk taking early in the life of a business's formation? How do I reduce certain taxes and fees, which you do get hit with, even if you're not a highly profitable venture in the first, say, three to five years? So the BET cut, I seek to retain that. The BPT cut, the profits tax, I seek to repeal. That's about $100 million a year of revenue lost. In my time as the director of corporate relations at UNH, I got, unlike Chris, who said he talked to 100 plus businesses, that I did. And I would spend a half a day to a day each with them. Head of HR, CEO, head of engineering. Asked them a ton of questions, learned a lot. They never asked for the business profits tax cut. They didn't ask for right to work. Uh, they didn't ask for a low minimum wage or no, no state minimum wage. They asked for talent. And they asked for entrepreneurship. They actually want new business formation around their existing business because part of what attracts young talent to an area is the idea that if they decide not to stay at the same company, you know, at say 28 years old, they know they're probably not staying there for 15 or 20 years. So they need to know that there's a dynamism, an entrepreneurial dynamism in the economy. That means that if they decide to leave or start their own business, that there are a lot of options where they won't have to pull up stakes and move to another part of the state or the country. Um, so it may be counterintuitive on the surface, but often many of the most self-aware established businesses are some of the biggest fans of encouraging this culture of entrepreneurship in the area. I think Chris has no uh, mission uh, or, or uh, awareness of how high a percentage of the upside in the economy comes from the young, new entrepreneurial side rather than focusing on the relatively small number of large businesses here or that he would seek to bring here. And that drives a whole different set of policies and priorities about how you uh, win the battle on the side of the economy, the side of, of job creation that I'm talking about today. It's very different from where Chris focuses his attention on policies and where he thinks the economy would grow. So that's a, it's kind of a macro answer. I'm glad to get into the weeds of what's different there and there, but that's a really big difference philosophically. Sometimes in our meet and greets, this comes up. Some people want to talk about this for half an hour. Uh, sometimes it barely comes up at all because folks want to focus on other issues. But it's in some ways the seminal issue for the next 20 years of New Hampshire because uh, if we are unable to get younger uh, and attract and retain uh, relatively young talent, and if we do not increase the amount of entrepreneurship in our economy, um, I'm, I'm very concerned about the long-term trajectory of our state and its success. So the, the other part of, uh, of the two things that you, you brought up, uh, attracting uh, families, making, making people want to raise a family here, um, the, the, one of the biggest keys to that is, uh, on, according to your plan, uh, improving public education. It's the issue. It's the right. bullseye. So by most metrics, um, comparatively, uh, New Hampshire's public education system ranks near the top mm. of states. So what needs improving and how are you going to do it? Uh, one thing I, I take pride in and it hopefully comes across if you come to my events, if you look at my website and all, is try to do a lot of homework before coming out with a specific plan. Put specifics in it. Try to include metrics. Look at best practices. Yesterday, just yesterday, I was in Plymouth. Uh, we were in a number of communities. I was in Plymouth and sat down uh, with some um, uh, education experts as part of ongoing conversations I have about different issues. This exact thing came up. Uh, first, most people would say the number one state for educational outcomes is Massachusetts. By not most, I uh, would say. But here's the thing. If Massachusetts is number one, the average Massachusetts student's uh, uh, outcomes is equal to the average Canadian overall. So I'm a dual citizen, all right? I'm, I'm born in Manchester, but I'm, I'm a dual citizen of uh, Canada. Folks are from Quebec, so I say this with tremendous affection for Canada. We should aim to do better than the average Canadian student. That was, that's what number one in America would be, the average Canadian kid. 
so we have to put this into context. We may be number four, but even number one is as good as the average kid in Canada. We, there's a tremendous ceiling that we have not yet achieved. They're awfully smart up there. Well, as, as and look, both my parents are Canadian, and so I totally agree with them. Um, <laughs> uh, however, uh, it shows that there's, there's a higher ceiling. Number two, uh, if I put one hand in scalding hot water and one in icy water, on average, it's going to feel pretty good. And I, I've just uh, described uh, the New Hampshire system of educating children. Uh, there are school districts in New Hampshire, Portsmouth would be one of them, uh, that have some of the highest performing elementary, middle, and high schools in the state. Uh, I've got supporters in about 215 towns, and it's because we've done events in almost every town, I mean, certainly every region. You learn so much, and you ask folks lots of questions about their local school district so you can compare and contrast. We're going to get sued again pretty soon. There's a, there's a good chance of that because of the way we fund education, the inequality in uh, uh, access to resources between Claremont and Bedford or, or Berlin and Windham is wider now than it was before the first lawsuit that we lost. Uh, and it means that although the average number, the overall number appears strong, there is great variance depending on what your zip code is. In the long run, if we are going to grow an economy statewide where uh, you can enjoy success, largely the southern tier, Hanover, Lebanon, you get the idea, uh, then we need to address this issue because here's what's going on. If your local community is perceived as not having quality local public education, in the long run, most of those communities are seeing a drop in overall population, significant, and a drop in student population, very significant. If your student population drops by 25% in 15 years, which is the average for the state of New Hampshire, we've lost a quarter of our K through 12 in 15 years as a state. Some parts of the state's more than 40% in 15 years. You don't drop your administrative cost by the same amount that you drop your population. It doesn't work like that. So it means that your administrative cost per pupil keeps going up, even as your student population goes down. And what that means is, a shrinking property tax base because the value of homes goes down if people don't think the schools are very good. Smaller and smaller group of people and businesses have to pay a higher and higher level of taxes. And a higher and higher percentage of the taxes they pay for schools go to administrative costs, dynamic I'm describing. You have to keep throwing more and more money at education just to stay equal because of this administrative element that's going on. Uh, now your commercial base shrinks as well because the residential base is shrinking. Not an attractive place to have your business. As the base keeps shrinking, the administrative cost keeps going up, you're in the vicious cycle of governance. And to get virtuous, to reverse it, one of the things we need to do is what states across the country have done for 120 years. Modernize public administration. The most conservative states in America, Wyoming, Mississippi, whatever, recognized 120 years ago that if four communities, as if they are largely separate, they just happen to be drawn around one border. The inefficiency, inequity that will eventually arise is inevitable. And so we're here. Uh, so even though the number overall is good, there's tremendous inequality in that number between districts, as much inequality as you'll find anywhere. And the other part is, we have amazing demographics on the whole that would suggest that we wake up in the morning in the top 10. We have the lowest poverty rate uh, as a state in America. We have more millionaires per capita than any state in America. We have one of the highest median incomes of any state in America. We have one of the highest percentages of at least one parent with a, a, a college degree of any state in America. And these factors are correlated closely to the educational attainment and opportunity of their children. So being fourth is a lot better than being 10th or 20th. That's obvious. But I think that when Chris Anunu says, look at how good a job we're doing, we're fourth, he is not recognizing that we start with tremendous demographic advantages on how they rank that number. The kids coming out of those homes are coming out from an advantageous position at a higher percentage than about any state in America. We should be in fourth or fifth or sixth just because of these natural advantages. It is the structural antiquity of our state 
that is uh, putting us at risk of the inequality getting wider over time as it has for the last 30 years. Okay. Can I just ask you to clarify, are you proposing doing away with the SAU system? Uh, or uh, you seem to be going in the direction of, of having uh, schools more unified. Uh, there are three. And, 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 and how would that? How what would that structure be yeah. that you're in your as you're envisioning it? So there are three elements to it, and um, you you don't need all three to happen simultaneously, but it would be good. It would be a, it would be better. So one is I need the state to move towards paying a higher percentage of the overall freight per student. The reason I say we're going to get sued, uh, and and is because some folks are already talking about it, and if you include kids that get additional aid. It's around 4,400 bucks a kid. 3,600 is baseline about, it goes to 4,400 on average. That's barely 30, 35% of the average spending per pupil. Uh, if nobody believes that's adequate, if I said drop 70% of the, the spending in your, your school district and then tell me if you think it would deliver an adequate education, most people, regardless of party affiliation, would say probably not, no. And this is the beginning of that legal conversation. So number one is the state's gonna have to um, provide more uh, support towards the cost of education. And I say pre-K through 12 on purpose. We're one of six states that do not offer uh, state funding for pre-K. The next closest one is South Dakota. This is a terrible message. It's lousy policy, and it's a terrible message to send to the very people that we're talking about trying to keep and, and bring in. So uh, I want to reverse the business profits tax cut. That's $100 million bucks a year. On the infrastructure side, uh, I'm proposing increasing the gas tax by about four cents a gallon, which would be about 30 million a year of additional revenue. Uh, that one's already tethered to infrastructure legally uh, and directly and indirectly. This is a pressure on budgets. I was in Franklin yesterday and we spoke with a group there. They have a tax cap. They have a lot. They've laid off 20 teachers in the last three years. It's pretty nasty. Um, their mayor believes that the key to getting talent, entrepreneurship, and young people in is to keep the tax cap. You know, be great fidelity to the tax cap. But it, that's not right. The number one factor is uh, the quality of your schools in, Frank, in Franklin or anywhere. And they are uh, hurting the quality of their schools, and it's, it's going in the wrong direction, not the right direction. Uh, so uh, whether you're Franklin or whomever, you need, so number two is the gas tax to help with the infrastructure cost, and they complained about that yesterday too. They don't have money for it. The third uh, is something that got a lot more attention two years ago, and I feel like I have a lot more friends now than I did two years ago on. It was uh, legalization, regulation, taxation of cannabis for adult use. I estimate that's $35 million a year. Some folks say it's more. Uh, I think the free market has a way of knocking that number down. We are literally going to be surrounded by legalization, including Canada, before the end of this year. So um, uh, that's a number that I think is more realistic than some of the rosier numbers. So that is the beginning of a conversation about the need for additional revenue. Two is what you're getting at. Uh, without making it mandatory, uh, I would put, uh, uh, put carrots in the budget that would incentivize communities on education, but also in other areas of the public sector to collaborate on administrative functions. Uh, if they want to collaborate all the way to consolidating, there can be incentives for that because there often is a short-term cost in the process of doing that, long-term savings uh, if done well. In the same time that we've lost 25% of our student population in 15 years, we've actually added 10% more SAUs. And there are many, I, there are many examples of why that is. Uh, that is driving up administrative costs further. And it's like an education bucket with a little hole in the bottom. You have to keep putting more and more water in the bucket to keep up as it leaks with increasing speed out of the bucket. So uh, making it mandatory, we found in other states that have tried that, that's a very painful process, particularly in the Northeast, and often backfires. So I've tried to learn from that. But there are communities that have told me over the last 18 months, if you put the, uh, uh, um, the budgetary incentives in place, that w that's the barrier that would allow us to begin some administrative consolidation that would begin to start filling that hole up. Um, then the third thing is, we need to talk to local communities. We're not a home rule state. And so they have very few ways of determining your tax liability. And, uh, and right now it's basically got a veteran's tax credit, you've got a few things related to age and income. Um, but if you're 47 years old and you lose your job, uh, we don't have a real good answer for you in the state of New Hampshire right now. And so there are a number of states 
that have uh, put in tools to at least allow local governments the option to include income as an element of determining your tax liability. Again, I think that in order to have that conversation, looking at other states that have gone down that road, you don't make it mandatory, but you have to put enabling legislation to even allow them to consider such a thing because we're not a home rule state. So if you look at it, I'm trying to, over time, increase the state's contribution to take the burden off local. I'm trying to provide incentives to make more efficient the way that we spend the money for government and then provide local government additional tools that better reflect their ability to pay for the remaining liability. And I see them as a system. You briefly touched on um, marijuana legalization. I was wondering if you could speak a little more specifically to in the past two years, some of the experiments um, in different states have either started, come to fruition. Is there anything you've kind of learned from those um, that you maybe want to imitate here or definitely don't want to imitate? Um, and then just talk a little more about some of the specifics, including like, I don't know if we have a good DWI test mm -hmm. for marijuana, some of those kinks that need to be worked yeah. out. First, very briefly, the, I think the three main benefits for legalization. Uh, the revenue that I mentioned earlier is actually the least of them. If I thought that the net societal impact was negative, I would oppose it even if it generated revenue, which it obviously, no matter what you think the number is, it would generate some net revenue. Uh, I think it helps with the opiate crisis, the gateway drug. In so many cases, it's, it's not cannabis. It's prescription opiates that end up being misused, uh, overused. They're for palliative, pur uh, palliative purposes. They're not, they don't cure you. They, they provide pain relief but with tremendous uh, exposure of risk to addiction. Uh, the use of cannabis in many of those situations can provide much of the pain relief with very little of the addictive risk that these opiates do. So I think it has a net positive impact in that regard. Uh, it would lower cost, although I appreciate the decriminalization, which helps address it already, some of the cost in the public sector uh, because of its illegality, uh, including uh, uh, law enforcement, uh, judicial, uh, incarceration. And then the third is the revenue. I, again, I say 35 million a year. That's pretty similar to what I said two years ago, but as other states around us have moved since 2016, um, I, I think that that number, I feel even more strongly that you need to be conservative in the revenue estimate because it's, it's no longer hypothetical. It's a real thing that the states around us have legalized it in different forms. So uh, that number I said about 35 million last, uh, last election, I believe, right around there. But um, I, I feel more comfortable that that's probably closer to reality, whereas I was trying to play it really conservative last time just to be smart fiscally about it. Um, the, President Trump, this is one issue where he's all over the map. This is one of many issues where he's all over the map. Uh, he speaks to state right on states' rights on this, but then he appointed Jeff Sessions, who has been about the biggest opponent of legalization of any major figure in the country, which sends a lot of mixed messages. Uh, until it is uh, reclassified at the federal level, it puts limitations on how you could implement legalization based on the experience of other states. So, for example, uh, it, some folks would like to um, uh, put it in the regime of the Liquor Commission, the Liquor Commission is having some of its own problems right now. I'm not sure I'm in the mood to give them additional responsibility until they can demonstrate they handle the current responsibility well. But suspend disbelief for a moment. If they are at a point, you, you could not do that legally right now because you could not have state employees handling it under the way the federal government curr currently classifies cannabis. So if that changes, that option goes from not applicable to, po to possible. Uh, uh, I would uh, I look at what Colorado and Washington have done because they have the longest track record. We can learn the most from it. And I think that, uh, again, heavily regulated, uh, but in a retail environment, sometimes there's uh, uh, ways that you zone with it to try to keep it to certain uh, business districts and outside of uh, relatively residential districts. Now, now you start getting the local government more and more. Uh, but um, I think they found that it has not increased youth use. If anything, it has marginally decreased it. Uh, it has taken some of the, the mystery out of it, you know. Uh, it has generated net revenue. In terms of the DWI or the operating under the influence, 
two things. Number one, I think there's a lot of work being done. Stanford University has done a lot of work to try to accelerate uh, the invention of a reliable um, equivalent of a of a alcohol test. It's a little trickier than alcohol, and so it's there's they're working on it. Stanford's well on its way, uh, so that's helpful. Uh, the other thing is I tell everybody, look, you shouldn't use cannabis and then go drive a car. You shouldn't use cannabis and then go to work. You shouldn't use cannabis and operate heavy machinery. You shouldn't use cannabis and then do your household budget. Uh, it's the same thing as alcohol. I think largely you could have the same conversation you do with alcohol about cannabis. Uh, I am not suggesting folks should go out and start using it like it's candy or something. Uh, but you should be responsible if you are going to use it. And by the way, a lot of people are. So we should not act like this, will, this is going to begin. We can do it in a responsible way, legal, and, uh, and we would enjoy the benefit of the revenue at the same time. topic of um, different substances, the opioid crisis, um, we hear a lot about not enough beds, not enough treatment capabilities. Um, recently we've also been hearing from some providers that the changes to Medicaid that are pending um, reimbursement rates are really going to hit treatment facilities. What as governor would you do to expand the treatment capacity of the state? There's two related problems. Uh, one, you hear a lot about one I don't think you hear politicians talk a lot about. The one we hear a lot about is the flat number of dollars that are needed. Uh, over the last three plus years, before I was running last time, uh, as well as throughout the last couple of years since then, I've visited a lot of recovery centers. Uh, when I do the budgets with them about how much, I ask them to do their dream budget for me, relative to their current budget. And I am, it never surprises me anymore because I keep seeing the same pattern. The, the delta between what they have and what they wish they had is much smaller dollars than, than you might guess. But it is a delta, it is real. And, uh, and so I estimate an additional six to eight million dollars a year of um, state commitment to recover, local uh, regional recovery centers around the state would not only uh, get them to that delta, a big part of which, by the way, is the ability to hire and retain mental health professionals, for example. Uh, much more of a, a hub-and-spoke model, where folks will come in initially for the addiction and the, the, the search for recovery. But uh, rarely are they there with only that as the concern, once you dig in. Mental health concerns in the majority of cases. Physical problems. Remember, a lot of folks got hooked in, in large part because of a prescribed opiate that brought them to the doctor's office originally because of an injury or a malady. It didn't cure the problem. It masked the pain of it. But the physical malady did not go away. So there's often, that's one of the spokes, is the, the wellness. Um, there's also the peer network, job training skills. As a friend of mine uh, in long-term recovery told me a while ago, and it stuck with me, uh, the opposite of addiction uh, is not sobriety. The opposite of addiction is connection. And so when people are, are battling long-term addiction, it's typically because of a disconnect with several really important parts of their life, physical, emotional, interpersonal. So it's, it's complicated. And it's an extra six to eight, two eight, that's 68, six to eight million dollars a year. That's one. Here's the second part though. It's not just the additional money, it's the sustainability and predictability of the money. This is the thing I don't hear enough about. It kept coming up that so much of their money is uh, coming from grants, uh, one to two year commitment, philanthropy. The majority of New Hampshireites say this is the biggest problem in New Hampshire. We've got almost a six billion dollar a year operating budget. And yet, it is remarkable in the work that I've done to see how much additional money done in a sustainable way where you're not hoping for philanthropy, wondering what's gonna happen after the end of your current grant, it doesn't have to be that way. And it means that they cannot make long-term optimal decision-making because they cannot know with certainty that the revenue is going to be there in the out years. This is one of the biggest problems I've heard time and time again for why they cannot hire mental health professionals, which may be the single most important value-added spoke to the hub. 
if you can get somebody that's a mental health professional, we have a shortage. If you can get somebody willing to take less money than they probably could make elsewhere, and then you do the interview, they will typically ask, how are you funding the position? And then, well, this year we have a grant and we can do this. What about next year? We're working on that. It's, it's an honest answer, but it's a very uncertain answer. And for a lot of folks in the, the, the very spar you know, uh, 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 difficult to fill in, uh, a world of mental health professionals, they, that's hard to go home and tell your spouse, I'm taking the job and I don't know next year. That's, we, I've seen that enough times. It's, so it's the predictable, it's additional money, but it's the stability of how we would fund it. I think uh, we would find really markedly improved outcomes because they'd be able to make optimal budgetary decisions. Now they have to make suboptimal decisions. And it's not because they don't know what to do. It's because they don't know where the money's going to be next year. So how do you make that switch? How do you make it um, make sure that there's that long-term funding in place, make sure it's stable? Oh, well, uh, there's a couple ways to go get it. And of course, there's a, it's a part of a big biennial budget process. To me, it's, uh, it's certainly worthy of uh, being funded uh, through the general fund. Uh, an, an additional way to look at it, you know, the New Hampshire ways we typically steal from dedicated funds to fill uh, uh, chronic budget deficits. And because we take one-time revenues and we, uh, to fill a recurring expense, and we, uh, we continue to act surprised that two years later the same problem is there because we didn't find recurring streams to fund recurring expenses and so forth. But the other way that we mess up in this regard is kind of what uh, Governor Sununu is doing right now. The good news on the alcohol fund is that although it's almost never been at the 5% of gross sales that it's supposed to be, the original intent, uh, Governor Sununu, to his credit, did push for and get an increase, uh, I believe, don't quote me exactly on the number, but I believe it went from about 1.7 to a little over 3% of gross sales. So I applaud that. That's the right trajectory. But here's the problem. Then they redefined eligible uses of the money, thus watering down what you could do with the increased revenue. You know, the, the, the commitment uh, for the, the gross uh, sales. So I want to get that number back up to 5%. The cannabis legalization would go into as part of uh, the alcohol fund. So you'd be uh, drawing the percentage from a larger base, which would have some benefit. And I would, uh, if I cannot get it through the general fund, then I would like to, uh, then I would, uh, and I will publicly, I've done it before, make the commitment that if I can't get it through the general fund, I would like to see that done explicitly through the alcohol fund. Um, and it's a small enough number. Uh, it's very doable in either scenario. But I want to publicly make that commitment and be held accountable you know, for getting it one way or the other way. So ideally, I'm talking about energy plan here now, mm -hmm. you favor um, building out renewable energy sources, solar and wind. And uh, typically, uh, these are much smaller than uh, fossil fuel and nuclear plants. So to that extent, do you support um, an increase in the, in the net metering cap to help build up this production? So Monday, I put out uh, a pretty comprehensive plan on this topic. And I'd spent a number of weeks. I've had a general idea for a long time on the issue. But before I put out a specific plan, uh, I, I spoke with a lot of folks uh, in various industries and the environmental community. Uh, my plan eliminates the cap, eliminates it. Not from one to five, eliminates it. Uh, other states are doing this. Here's the, here's the thing, uh, and uh, we can talk about my opponent a little bit here because there is a choice folks have to make, and I understand, you know, I've been to Cheshire County about 35, 40 times as a candidate in the last year and a half. I feel like it's my home too now, and uh, it's, I think we're gonna do very well here in, the, in, uh, in about five weeks. Uh, I think that on uh, policy, on a conversation about the future of our state and the future of the party, I think I uh, represent uh, an exciting match that connects very well uh, across the state, but particularly in this part of the state. Yeah, this is about what the next 20 years in New Hampshire is going to be like. We're making those decisions right now. So on energy policy, I'm looking that way. Uh, we are playing small ball on a lot of issues, but you need to have the big goal in order to have the right policies to get to it. So. Here's the number one thing that came out of this. I believe very strongly in this. Um, you need to provide the signals in the economy, in renewables and in conservation-related technology. 
in order to move the needle on, on the private sector, putting the money into the places that will blow up the percentage of our electricity that comes from renewables. So you need to set the tone at the very top. So it started with a renewable portfolio standard. That was, that's the number one tool to get where we want to go on renewables. Right now, we have a commitment to get to 25% by 2025. Okay, we're at around 18% right now. Um, looking at what other states are doing, including in New England, I've set a goal now that I want to get to 50% renewables by 2030. All right, so this is it. This it's, it's drives the whole thing. 25% by 2025 is the current goal. 50% by 2030. Vermont, Maine, and Massachusetts will all be at 50 or high, much higher, almost 60% in, in I think Maine's case by the early 2030s. The thing that they generally have in common uh, that has accelerated their growth in renewables has been that they've uh, created these standards that have communicated to the market. Uh, you should invest in solar, uh, wind, uh, to some extent biomass, um, uh, in, uh, offshore wind included in the long run. 10% uh, of Vermont's electricity is solar. 8% Massachusetts. New Hampshire, one half of 1%. When I talk to people in the solar industry and in the non-solar industry, people that do everything from gas to wind, they all said the same thing. They're like, if you, if you eliminated the metering cap, you would see uh, the, um, the payback, the, the long-term investment for people that are making the decision whether or not to go to solar, for example. The math is much more favorable for them because if they uh, generate the excess electricity, there's that opportunity to sell it back and, the, and they can see that payback, uh, even if it takes a, a, a window of time, they can see it. By going to 50% by 2030, now it communicates to all forms of renewable, as well as conservation, by lowering the denominator, that this is going to be a very aggressive market for it. And that's why you've seen Vermont, Massachusetts, Maine, and the West especially, but I don't want to go, it's not quite apples to apples see tremendous growth in this. So I feel like Molly, uh, who I like very much personally, but I think if you look at her record in the state Senate, if you look at what she's proposing or not really proposing as a candidate, there's a dramatic difference in the uh, generational vision of where we have to go. There's a tremendous difference in the level of specificity in how we would get there. And it's a difference in are we gonna, are we gonna are we going to go bigger in how we look at the future of New Hampshire, or are we going to play small ball? So right now we're debating, you know, one versus five. We, that's not the right conversation. We need to think about the renewable portfolio standard and then eliminate the cap. Other states are doing that, and that's what's working. I also think that we're the only uh, coastal state on the, in the east who has not authorized the federal government to do offshore wind, uh, a study for offshore wind. Uh, I think Kristen Nunu is wrong on that, and as governor, I would authorize the federal government to conduct that study as they are in the rest of New England's coastal states. Uh, and I think that there's opportunity there in the long run, but it certainly won't happen if you don't begin the process of understanding what the opportunity would look like. So if, if you eliminate the, the cap, and as I understand it, even uh, the argument against raising the cap uh, is that, uh, on net metering, is that then you're allowing uh, new plants uh, that uh, solar wind that would feed into the system uh, to be subsidized by by non the the, the non-renewable yep. the, the people who aren't feeding back in right. uh, so is that fair to the generators that are already powering the state well uh, a few other uh, elements to the plan and again I would urge you to look at it because uh, I this is I is a legitimate concern, I'm aware of it. Um, we have energy efficiency programs uh, that in, in the most general of terms, it's, for example, we're supposed to fund energy efficiency programs in large part with uh, REGI funds that are, this is the whole point of REGI, is you're supposed to uh, be able to put the money back into the system to accelerate energy efficiency programs for homes and businesses, which over time lower consumption of electricity, you know, it has this virtuous effect. But our legislators have, uh, it's, they want to say they kept Reggie, 
without doing that, which it's, bare, it's not really a, the program. It doesn't work if you take 80% uh, of the money and you just give it right back. You've basically created an, uh, a bureaucratic uh, entity that, that handles the money, gives it back, takes a little bit because of the trans transaction, but then there's no energy efficiency done with that money. So one is we got to get off of that 20% of Reggie back to 100% or as much as I can get out of the next legislature. That's one. Also, when you move the renewable portfolio standard up, uh, you have alternative payments along the way for uh, suppliers that don't meet their metrics in the various ways. And uh, that already occurs. That would occur at a somewhat accelerated rate in the near term as the transition occurs. That Much of that money would also go into the energy efficiency fund. So to your point, if we're going to do what I'm suggesting, we also need to be prepared to dramatically strengthen the energy efficiency program to allow people to accelerate their investment in becoming more energy efficient, regardless of the source of electricity, they're how they get their energy. Um, this is part of how that market takes shape, is we need to provide the signals at the top that allow the private sector to jump in. And this would communicate that there's gonna be tremendous growth in energy efficiency investment as well. One last part of it. Uh, I think one of the unintendedly regressive parts of the whole energy conversation is on the matching program. Generally, it goes like this. Uh, they'll come in and do an energy audit. They'll identify $8,000 of investment that would lead to a measurable amount of energy savings. They'll pay for half, except the bucket's empty really quick, so they'll tell you next year maybe. But imagine they have the money. You pay the other four grand, which is great if you have the four grand. So it has the effect of those with the liquidity, the, the relative wealth, to be able to put in the, the match to do the energy efficiency program, get to enjoy all of the operating cost savings because they were able to put the four grand in. Well, who doesn't? It's the people on the bottom half of the income and wage scale who don't have the capital to do the matching part of the energy efficiency program. And yet, those are the homes that overwhelmingly would see the greatest reduction in energy consumption because the nature of people's homes or units that are on the lower end of the wage scale tend to be more energy inefficient. That's a fact. So you would save more energy in our economy, but you need a progressive match on it. So as your income level is up, goes up or down, the percentage of the match would go up or down to the point where at the lowest ends of the income scale, it wouldn't be a 50% match, it might exceed 75, 85% match. Because if we can get that household in a limited income in the game of energy efficiency, we will save more energy faster and they will have more money in their pocket because their operating cost, you know if they save $40 a week on energy costs, $30 a week, we know at the bottom half of the wage scale, that money immediately goes back into the economy, just like a cut in the payroll tax does at the federal level. At the higher end, there's benefit, but it tends to be used more for long term because they, they have liquidity. So I understand the challenge you've described, and I've tried to specifically address it by accelerating in a meaningful way residents and businesses' ability to get into the energy efficiency game as well. So that their rate, people focus on their rate, but you, don't, you shouldn't focus on your rate. You focus on, nobody pays a rate, you pay a bill. It's rate times consumption. And if I can lower, cons accelerate the lowering of consumption while we're moving in this transition on energy, that's the other way we can address your utility bill. But that's two separate things. I mean, you can lower your consumption and still have the rate going up. And, and then your bill doesn't go up. anything. Right, but your bill won't go up either, which was what you asked about. You said, will they be subsidizing? In the long run, it'll go down that. But in the short run, I, and here's the thing. I think most of our elected officials in Concord, both parties, both parties, so I'm not digging one or the other here. Everything's two-year terms in New Hampshire. And so we tend to do policy in two-year terms. Meanwhile, we're getting passed by, by other states that are thinking in generational terms. And on the subject of energy, if there's any topic, I would argue things dealing with demographics, education because of the impact as we described earlier, and on energy. If, there's, if there are policy areas where we need a leader who is willing to talk in specific terms, in generational terms, energy is 
absolutely one of those issues, or else we're not going to get where we need to go and we're going to get passed by. Steve, so you've historically been opposed to casino related um, legislation. Yep. Uh, the Supreme Court has thrown a new wrinkle into all of this, but with legalized sports gambling, and states are now scrambling to implement this, find ways to implement it, and possibly um, um, get into some of this potential revenue windfall. I read an interesting story right before I was coming in here about the governor of Connecticut who's on his way out Malone, yeah. his term, who's given his state legislature seven days to decide if it wants to, to, do, to deal with this. And this is a state that has, you know, federally recognized Indian tribes that are I mean, generating hundreds of millions right. of dollars for them. So where does New Hampshire need to be relative to this? Can we afford to wait? Do we need to be trying to seize upon this? Uh, I uh, have and continue to oppose uh, expanded gaming, including casinos. So that, that position has not changed. Uh, and although I'm probably the biggest sports fan you're ever going to meet, um, uh, I, uh, I want to be thoughtful before I give a position. And uh, I would want to give uh, both uh, my legislature as well as myself more than seven days before I come up with a position on that. Uh, so um, uh, I can tell you that my natural bias is what it has been for a long period of time that I think having the best state in America to start and raise a family and to start and grow a business uh, and a culture uh, that involves expanded gaming is not generally uh, a great match. Uh, but uh, before I take a firm position, you know, with energy, I was asked for three or four weeks to, about specific plans. And, uh, and I said, give me a few weeks because I have the idea, but I want to talk to a lot of people before I land in a place and I can get I give a sophisticated uh, and holistic policy on it, which is what we did with energy this week. And so with this, I'd like to do the same thing before I give you uh, a final and hopefully intelligent answer on it. You uh, outlined a number of plans and your solutions for how to fund them. Uh, to what extent are they conditioned on having a legislature that is of the same party as you? And if you don't have that, how do you react to that? Well, I have thought a lot about that. Uh, first, we've spent a lot of time over the last year and a half trying to maximize the chances of having majorities uh, in the various uh, in the, in the House, Senate, and even Executive Council so as to be able to more easily pursue these, um, these goals. Uh, so for example, we've helped recruit a lot of candidates, uh, particularly for the House and to some extent the Senate, because we've done so many events that we'll find people that are really exciting, thoughtful, uh, often new to politics, and we stay with them. And they say, I'm, I'm with you, I love your policies, I love the specificity of it, the energy, the kind of optimism of it, and the doability. You, I, hopefully you can kind of see the auditor in me you know, I got these progressive values, but an auditor sensibility about how you would go about getting to them. And I think that's a unique combination that is very attractive to a surprisingly wide swath of the populace. It's not just hardcore Democrats or people that voted for Bernie. It's a lot of people that voted for Romney in 12 and Clinton in 16. They're not Republicans anymore, not in the world of Trump. But they're not quite Democrats yet, and they don't want the Democratic Party to be the party of not Trump or not Sununu. Uh, they want us uh, to have progressive values that we're unafraid to articulate, but with the sensibility of the math behind it, the how will you do these things. And uh, it's one reason why I think um, we have a far superior chance than Molly uh, will uh, to succeed in the general election, because it is a, it's this kind of bold banner what we describe as the uh, a bold banner of unmistakable colors with no pale pastel shades. It's actually uh, something that Ronald Reagan said in 76 about what he thought the future of the Republican Party would be to get Democrats and independents. He said it was not by being blurring differences, avoiding detail, moderating for the sake of moderation, sounding apologetic, because that implies you got something to apologize for. It was a banner of bold, unmistakable colors with no pale pastel shades. And he was right may not agree with what he did once he got there, but he understood the magnitude of the moment when politics was really messy and how to take people that were poised to leave their political home and figure out what their new home would be. And eventually they will find a new home. 
and I want to def- I want to be an important part of defining the future of New Hampshire. I'm, I'm from here. I'm not going anywhere. I, I really want to help. I think I can do a lot to help solve it. And so we bring in this new coalition, and uh, and I think it maximizes the chance of having a majority. I think we get to about 230 seats in the House, Democrats in the House. The Senate is trickier because of the gerrymandering of the, the current time, uh, but I believe we can get a majority of 13 or 14 in the Senate as well. Um, and I want to give a platform that they can own as well. And you'll find that many, many new candidates around the state have embraced the policies on the website because they like them, they're excited by them, and they're delivered, they're, they're built in a way that they're uh, replicable. You can, you can explain them because we put it in there. Uh, I'm really trying to do this the right way because otherwise I'm just going to veto bad ideas all the time. And that's not why I'm working so hard. So that's important. But uh, look, uh, part of the new Democratic Party that I envision is one that is proudly progressive on, on these policies we're talking about today, but is also very nimble with the math of it, can explain the math of it, and is passionate about entrepreneurship and growth. And the, the, the new Democratic Party is one that understands that progressive inclusive values and a passion for entrepreneurship, that's not a choice. That's actually the path to the other. And there are many, tens of thousands of New Hampshireites who share those values I'm describing. They just need to know that the Democratic Party can be their home for a generation to, to, um, to deliver on it. And so I think that there are, even if I don't quite have the majority in one of the bodies, I believe that the math of it, uh, the entrepreneurship element, the, the pro-growth element of it, is very attractive to a lot of Republicans who um, uh, are, are looking for similar outcomes. We may disagree on the means, but you know, most, most of your friends, whether they're Republican or Democrat, they want quality education in your community. Um, uh, they are willing to talk about guns. And I hope we, we'll talk about that in a minute because I spent a lot of time on that. That's a top tier issue for a lot of these Romney Clinton voters as well. Look, I think I'm going to win the primary and the general election. And I believe that when I do, we will have majorities that will come along with it because I believe that we are setting the tone for a generation of what it's going to mean to be a New Hampshire right, right now. Uh, and I think that's going to excite the base as well as a lot of folks that will become a part of the new base of the Democratic Party. Um, I think those are the stakes right now. Let's talk about guns because there's no probably a more challenging issue when you're talking about trying to bring people together with opposing views on an issue. But meaningful gun law reform is important to you. And in New Hampshire, perceived gun rights, uh, there's nothing maybe as charged or as political as that topic. So how do you push through the reform that you want to achieve and uh, get, some, get some results? Well, uh, one of the greatest things I've learned, I mentioned earlier you try to, you're trying to teach when you're on the stump, right? Who's this person? I'm learning more than I'm teaching. One of the things I learned back in February, I think it was late February, uh, when I put out a seven-point gun plan on the steps over at Lebanon uh, City Hall, because they, they were trying to have a gun-free uh, school zone, and they found out there's a 15-year-old law that doesn't allow them to do so. So we did it there, and that's when a conservative talk show host told his listeners, you should go to Marshan's event tomorrow and tell him how you feel. And about 20 people with guns showed up at my event. And so we got a lot of press for it. Uh, and... Uh, and then about 20 other people spontaneously showed up on uh, supportive of my positions. I was very anxious at that first moment because it was this very intense, it was very intense. About 40 people and a lot of press. We did Facebook Live, so this was all live. I, we do almost all our events Facebook Live. I want people, like, uh, you know, the message is the message. I want folks to get it. Um, but this is what I learned. When you say there are four kinds of gun violence that I'm trying to address in the seven-point plan, homicide, domestic violence, the threat of mass shooting, and then the big one, suicide. It's overwhelmingly the big one. 93% of gun deaths the last two years in this state are suicide. 93%. Most people are not aware of the magnitude of that challenge. I have somebody very close to me that during this campaign uh, made an attempt and uh, was not successful. Uh, but if there had been a gun in the house, I think it would have been. So this was a policy thing, but it's personal now. And we know in the states that have a 48-hour wait period 
They have 52% fewer gun suicides in the states that do not. So now I'm telling you, 93% of gun deaths in the state are suicide. And that I know there's a policy that works that will reduce it by more than half if we, if we have the courage to do it. How am I not going to go for that? You have to go for that. And it turns out that when I say that that way, and then we talk about red flag law, and we talk about universal background check, and we talk about a bump stock ban, and we talk about gun-free zone uh, for schools, and more. They come up to me with their AR-15 in their hand, like they did in Lebanon that day. And this one guy came up after, and he said, I don't agree with all your policies. And I told him, you're holding an AR-15, I'm aware that you don't agree, you've already communicated you don't agree with all my positions. But you have an argument, you make the, you make the argument, you make a good argument. And I agree with most of your points, not all, but I agree with the majority of your points. I lost somebody to a suicide last year, he said to me. And so I'm with you on the 48 hour wait period. And the red flag law, that is reasonable. And universal background check, that's reasonable. And bump stocks, we shouldn't even have them in the first place. This is the guy holding an AR-15. He drove 40 minutes to tell me what I could do with that AR-15. And by the end of the conversation, we got to a long place, a long way down. Uh, when you bring up suicide impassioned, in an impassioned way, it opens the door to conversations with the gun owner community because they hear what I'm saying. I am not saying you own a gun and thus you're a bad person or you own a gun and thus you can't get near a school. I'm not saying that. I'm saying we got a problem to solve and in New Hampshire, most of that problem is suicide and we can do things about it. And so many people have been touched by suicide in the state. Once you open a conversation, the number of people in my meet and greets, it's one, of them come, one or more people come up after and they tell me a story, you know? There, I mean, there, were, there, was a, uh, one of the, there was a young woman on the side of my side of the argument who came up to me after and she was crying. And she's like, I lost my brother to suicide last year, a gun suicide. She's, and, and she's like, I'll go to the mat for you because you're the first politician talking about it like this. And uh, man, that's one place, I don't care if Bill O'Brien is the Speaker of the House next year, I know that's a place we could do something. There's tremendous bipartisan opportunity. I did an event right over here at the, uh, at the Rotunda on guns in March, I think. And we had people show up. We did them around the state. We did hour and a half town halls just on guns. The Keene GOP chair was quoted in your paper as saying that five of the seven points he had no problem with, and he appreciated my approach to governance, the way that I'm trying to solve problems, to the point where the journalist said, wait a second, are you going to vote for Marchand? And, oh, no, no, I'm, I'm the chair of the Keen Republicans. I, I got to vote for Sununu. I'm just saying, not bad. If I can get the guy that drove 40 minutes with a gun to tell me what to do with it to get to that point, and I get the Keen GOP chair on the record with your paper willing to say what he said, I know we can do really good work on this. And I think I have found the way to do it. And I will do it. I will do it. I, I, um, the appetite is there. And I tell my Democratic friends, don't play defense in the conversation. Don't be offensive. You can play offense and not be offensive. But the suicide element is such a dominant part. In 2016, 132 people in New Hampshire died from a gun. And 123 of them were suicide. That's where the opportunity to improve lives and save lives is at. And I know how to do it, because others are doing it. So I'm going to do everything I have to, I'm going to do everything I can to do something about it. Once you put into place 48 hour wait period, red flag law, say that reduces it by 50%, that's still 60 gun suicides. How do you have that next harder conversation about, well, there are a lot of guns already in these houses? Because that, that strikes me as kind of where it gets a little trickier with some of the gun rights um, well, advocates. And I don't mean this in a negative way, but... Um, on this and many other issues, I'm seeking to make cultural change. I'm trying to do hard things. Uh, if we can take, I'm doing some quick math in my head, if more than, if, if 90, let's call it 90, if 90% 90 of gun deaths are from one source, and just the 48 hour wait period appears to have the effect because of the spontaneous nature of suicide attempts, of which I've learned a lot about it in the last year, could cut that in half. We go from, in 2016, from uh, that 123 gets down to about 60. So that's 60, right? I mean, I'm, you know, 
Um, I, I, that's step one. I mean, nobody else is doing that. So I, I'd like to focus at least, I, you know, I don't want you to leave here saying, well, Steve didn't answer how he's going to solve the other half today. Nobody's doing the first half. So like we can do a tremendous amount with what would be over 40% of gun deaths. The red flag law has the effect on domestic uh, violence uh, because, and that seems that appears to be one of the greatest positive impacts of red flag laws because there are certain characteristics that other states, including red states like Indiana, who have, has a red flag law, that have found um, that uh, you can identify certain threatening types of remarks. It doesn't take your guns away. What it does is it, it temporarily, it gets the warrant to temporarily take the guns uh, from the person who's exhibiting violent tendencies or threats of violence. Then they expedite a legal process through a judge. It's, it's very quick. Again, it's working in Indiana, okay? And, uh, and Connecticut and many other states. Uh, and if they find that at the end of that process that the threat is real, they can hold on to the guns for an extended period of time and, and deal with the situation. It could be counseling, it could be, could be a legal situation, whatever it is. If, there is. if it's found that there is no threat, uh, it was uh, uh, unfounded, they receive the guns. And this is in a very short amount of time. So on the domestic <coughs> violence, I mentioned four. The suicide in 48 hour appears to be this dominant positive factor. On domestic violence, the red flag law appears to be the strongest tool we have in the toolbox. Uh, I would argue universal background checks, including private sales, uh, has a positive effect on virtually on, on all the four form, uh, forms of gun violence. Um, and to be fair, in New Hampshire, we have almost no non-suicide gun violence in terms of deaths. I mean, we should say that. I said in 2016 there were 132 gun deaths and 123 of them were suicide. That means there were nine that were not. And I think one or two of them were accidental, which is a, a different conversation. So I, do, I think even as a Democrat, or as a, as a policymaker, as an elected, as a leader, I also need to acknowledge that I, um, uh, we've been fortunate not to have a mass shooting at a school, but a lot of states said that until it happened. And so, for example, the gun-free zone allows the ability to identify risk before it arrives on campus. I think, you know, Chris Anunu has said we should arm the teachers at one point. And to me, when you focus on that or the hardening of the school itself, it basically says I'm going to wait until the problem is literally on the doorstep before I'm going to think about policy that might lower the risk. I don't want to put a moat around your school as an answer to gun violence. I, I'm trying to go bigger than that. And most of the policies I'm describing would have the effect statistically, of me dramatically reducing risk. But again, suicide is where almost all the gun deaths are. Um, yeah, that's what I got on that. Uh, I know there are a few other things I want to make sure that come up in the, whatever time we have left, but I want to make sure I answer your questions. Yeah, um, we, are, we are about there, uh, but I do want to give you a, a five minutes to to raise other issues. I, I know you have other sure. policy points. Sure, and have. please, I ask, please review them. Uh, uh, I mentioned a few times earlier that I think that the choice, both in the primary and in the general, is, is very real. It's real on policy. Uh, it is, when I, you know, and it's, it comes from deep roots. Uh, when, if folks want to know why I think uh, health care, uh, universal health care, is the, is the right policy move, it is not just because it's cerebral, because I see what other countries are doing and ask why we can't get better outcomes at a better price. It's also because in 1990, my dad lost his insurance, we dropped our insurance because my dad built houses and there was a recession in 1990. And so my dad got stuck with a house he couldn't sell. And then we dropped our insurance. And then three months after that, my mom had a heart attack. And that's an $80,000 medical bill at CMC Hospital, and so we filed bankruptcy. It's the number one reason people file bankruptcy in this country, personal bankruptcy. Uh, and I hear Chris Sununu say last year that the problem people have with insurance is that they wish they had the freedom to not have to buy it. That's what he said. Did you know that was the problem with insurance? People wish they had the freedom to not have to buy it. He's a son of a governor. He is the brother of a senator. I'm the son of Norm Marchand with an eighth grade education who came down from Quebec in the 60s, and Suzanne Marchand who came down from Quebec in the 60s with an 11th grade education. 
I experienced the freedom to not have health insurance. I had that at freedom. It's the least free my family ever felt. We all thought we did something wrong. We didn't do anything wrong. The system was wrong. This, I, I think the unique combination I bring that doesn't just give us an opportunity to win the election, but to make real, positive, generational change happen is the combination of the cerebral, the, the experience as an auditor and a mayor, the data-driven approach to governance with the, um, with the emotion and the authenticity and the passion to work with people to get it done. So a lot of these things have, I, the four point plan is really important. I want you to know we've thought it through and have a, a, a way to get there. But they come from a place and so many, you know, why do I feel the way I do about immigration? I know we haven't talked about that directly today. Immigration is arguably the bullseye of getting younger and more entrepreneurial. That's the youngest part of America's population. It's also the most entrepreneurial part of our population. I was born in a French speaking home in the west side of Manchester. I gave my immigration plan in front of a statue of Ferdinand Gagnon on Lafayette Park in Manchester. I was born a block from there. And I did it because in the late 19th century, he was seen in my community as a leader in exposing discrimination against the dominant immigrant group of that time, French Canadians. If he doesn't do what he did, I'm not in America right now. My parents are not in America right now. I'm not here, I'm not here. So we got an obligation to stand on the shoulders of people who went to the mat on immigration, which is this amazing element to America's success. And there's a lot of trash talk going on right now about immigration. And we got to stand up really strong to push back on these powerful forces against it. That's, that's from here from a long time ago. On education, why do I believe in the power of public education? It's not just because entrepreneurs and CEOs tell me that. It's because we didn't have anything. I, my sister and I had the little free lunch ticket. You know, they, they used to give you a different colored ticket, which was lousy because all the other kids knew you didn't have any money because you had the pink one, you know? And Gosford Park Elementary School on the west side of Manchester, that was our local public school. It was amazing. Miss Gogan, Miss Heward, Miss Monalak, Miss Tessier, my second through fifth grade teachers. There were so many kids like me that didn't have anything. And if it had not been for that school, I wouldn't be here today. Uh, so when I hear about voucherization, it makes me very upset on a policy level. But I, under, I believe that if Chris Sununu had grown up in a house like mine, he would not believe what he believes today. I really, I do, that's how I feel. And I think that as much as I appreciate Molly as a good person, um, we have an opportunity to create a powerful contrast, both on the policy issues, to show, but also on a personal level. We're both, Chris Sununu and I are both 44-year-old, high energy, sons of New Hampshire. And that's about where the comparison splits. I think that if folks see the difference on a policy level and on a personal level, and I show them that we got the vision to know where to go and the competence to know how to get there and the courage to say it out loud, and you inject that with the energy of youth and the optimism of an immigrant's kid, I think we're gonna win this election and we're going to do it in a way that's going to be positive. We're going to make people feel good about the future of New Hampshire. And will give us a mandate that will allow us to get real things done in the next two years. So I'm not saying anything negative explicitly about anybody else. I'm really trying to do this in a way that says, I think I can help us take advantage of an amazing opportunity. Uh, and, uh, and that's why I'm working as hard as I am. And I, don't, I think I'm the only person in this primary that can... Uh, truly uh, take advantage of the moment that we're in in a way that will deliver outcomes that I think you're all going to be proud of on the back end. That's why I'm running.